Hey everybody, Marshall here to share some really cool news with you. I, I trust at this point you've all heard about fake yeast. This is that Norwegian ale strain that can ferment cleanly at temperatures as high as, no joke, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 38 degrees Celsius. Absolutely crazy stuff. Well, last year, Imperial Yeast dropped A43 Loki, their Kvake strain, as a seasonal release, which meant we all had a pretty small window to get our hands on some. Not anymore. Imperial Yeast recently announced they're making A43 Loki a year-round strain due to popular demand. They're excited about it. I'm super excited about it. I've had some amazing beers fermented with Loki at terrifyingly warm temperatures. It is amazing stuff. Go grab some A43 Loki and see what all the fuss is about for yourself. Some of my absolute favorite beer styles originated in Germany, a country with an incredibly rich brewing history that continues to have influence today, not only on the types of beers being brewed, but various processes used to make them. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And joining me to talk about the method of spunding is contributor Jake Houlihan. I'm not even sure I'm saying that right. Is it spunding or spoonding? Um, I think you could say it either way. But um, regardless, it's a specific method that we're going to talk about. I think I first learned about spunding uh, a couple years ago. And as somebody that's very interested in lagers and even British bitters, and we'll talk about that a little bit more too, uh, spunding was you know something that really stuck with me and was a method that I wanted to explore a little bit more and learn more about. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, I, it's actually something that I only learned of pro, and I've been brewing for a long time. I, I think I only heard, learned of it, um, uh, got four or five years ago. Uh, and I, I haven't done it yet, uh, but I've got a couple spunding valves that I should probably put to use. Uh, we're going to get into the details of what exactly spunding is in a bit, but suffice to say, it's a, it's a method for naturally carbonating beer that some swear has a per- perceptibly uh, positive impact. I've never done it again, uh, but but I know you have Jake, and I'm looking forward to learning more about your experience. Uh, all right, if you appreciate what it is we're doing here and you'd like to help us to continue doing it, please consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, where for a very small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com. This month, they're offering $5 off bundles of uh, hop rhizomes for all you green thumbs out there. Uh, and you'll also get an invite to a monthly live Q&A session with someone neat in the brewing world. Coming up later this month is Randy Mosier, lauded author, brewer, and all-around cool guy. He's going to be taking questions for about an hour in our private Facebook group where all past sessions are available for new members to uh, to go back and view whenever they like. Uh, You can learn more about being rewarded for your support over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. All right, we've got some feedback this episode, which is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who have everything you need to deck your brewery out from super convenient products like the quick clean take apart ball valve, which turns any standard NPT kettle port into an easy-to-clean tri-clamp valve, to electric controllers like the BCS-482 that allows for full brewery automation. Seriously, if you need it, they've got it. Go check them out at brewershardware.com. And don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. That's brewershardware.com. Tom McCune from New Britain, Connecticut, wrote in with some feedback on our recent open fermentation episode. He said, I had this idea on how open fermenting could work to produce more esters. This is just speculation, but it could be uh, possible. But could it be possible that this process could support under pitching? My thinking is that since the stress from the pressure will be less, that the yeast might be able to tolerate a lower cell count uh, to milliliter ratio, thus leading to more esters from more growth without the off flavors that usually result from the stress of under pitching. I love your podcast. Keep up the good work and never stop force feeding Jersey and Tim weird beers. I hope to one day send in a beer myself. Tom, I hope you send one in as well. Uh, Jake, what do you think about uh, what do you think about this idea of of under pitching to to produce more esters? I mean, I think like the answer to many questions in in brewing and home brewing, maybe. Um, <laughs> you, you know, these five gallon fermenters that we're using with a simple airlock and about an inch of liquid above it. That's not much pressure. So. Like the atmospheric stress or, or, or the, you know, the back pressure on this yeast is really not much. Um, so I don't really know that it's having this huge detrimental effect that we all uh, presume it might be, but yeah, maybe. Yeah. You're, you're talking about under pitching specifically, right? Not, not right. necessarily with open fermenting. Yeah. I, I'm not, um, I'm not entirely convinced that pitch rates are, and I, I, I get a lot of crap for this, but uh, that pitch rates are as, as important as a lot of us have been led to believe. Um, I, there's a, you know, I sort of feel like if you've got enough yeast, not necessarily, you know, the, the 
the prime number, but uh, but if you've got enough and it's healthy and you're, you're minding sanitation and and other aspects like that, that you're probably going to produce a decent beer with it. We haven't been able to show that it that it leads to a perceptible uh, difference compared to beers, you know, uh, fermented with with proper pitch rates. But maybe when uh, you're doing it with an open fermented beer, it will have a difference. Definitely something to play with. Uh, and Tom, just just so you know, we have we have no plans to, uh, you know, yield to the haters. Jersey and Tim will continue to drink and review the beers that you guys send in. So uh, if you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com. Leave us a voice message by calling 95 one four 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 zero three two zero or drop us a note on social media speaking of jersey and tim jake are you into mead at all uh no <laughs> i did have a very good mead um i was i was in austin a few months ago and our, our friend matt crispin gave me some meads to take home and i had an amazing one but that's about the extent of my mead drinking yeah yeah i've i've, I've tried making one that was horrendous um but i I'm, I'm not much of a fan either um i think it seems like every time uh, somebody sends me in uh, some form of a mead for the guys to review we end up bringing up matt crispin and and it's for good reason he's probably one of the better i've had a lot of good commercial mead i, I the stuff matt's making to me uh, just outshines all of that stuff um i, I you know i'm okay with mead i'm not big enough fan to make them for myself well listener paul Shanks sent me uh, uh, sent me a melamel that he made. Melamel is just a mead that has fruit in it. And about it, he said, in August of 2018, I picked up two quart jars, so about three and a half pounds per jar, seven pounds total, of local honey from a beekeeper and added a little bit of clover honey from our local grocery store. Uh, on August 10th, eight, uh, 2018, I warmed 5.28 gallons of water uh, to mix the honey and ferment it out. I think that's like 20 liters or so. Um, on October 20th of that, of that year. I racked the meat over to a secondary with two and a half pounds of blueberries and two pounds of strawberries after I killed the yeast to prevent it from fermenting out with the sugars from the fruit. On November 9th, I pulled some of the melamel from the fermenter and warmed it in a small pot. I then added two pounds of orange blossom honey from the local grocery store to back sweeten the melamel since it was bone dry. Once cooled, I poured it as gently as possible into the keg, then racked the melamel on top of it and force carbonated it. This is such a complicated sounding drink. Uh, on January 28th of 2019, so just a couple months ago, I bottled the remains of the keg since I was bottling a bunch of beers that day. It comes in at 6.9% ABV, started at uh, OG of 1048 with an FG of 0.995. Uh, sounds like an interesting one. Uh, what did the guys think? One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. I have feelings too, goddamn it. Redneck feelings. Oh, look at this one, Jersey. Yeah, I know what it is. It's a little. Uh, I feel like we're doing communion again, buddy. Yeah, we are. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, it tastes just like it smells. A little cinnamon. A little cinnamon. You get your mustache caught <laughs> in your teeth there, bro. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to taste it. It's grapey. It's not grapey. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Not what you expected. Huh? Oh, dude, there's some funk in there, too. I don't know. There's some fruit. There's some funk. <sighs> this one stumped me, as they all do. But Don't stump Tim now. We're having such a good time. We're having a ball. Like clove. Clove taste. That's garlic. No, not a garlic clove. What are we talking about? You know, the cigarette <laughs> clove. Well, it's not beer. And if someone calls it a beer, then I will fight them. I will fight them. I like it. There's some funk in there, dude. There's like gym sock. It's kind of growing on me. How about we rate this one on a scale of beer or not beer? I'm going to call it not beer. It's not beer. It tastes good. So does Mountain Dew Baja Blast. All right. I'm with you. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it tastes I great. I have no idea. Let's finish it, but it's not beer. On my contract, it specifically says. <laughs> I am a beer reviewer, so you submit non-beer, then you get what you get. Mm. It is good. It's good. Like after a whatever workout. it's supposed to be, I bet it's really good at it. How about that? All right, we'll give them that. I can't rate it's it. Very clear. Oh, muscle it up and tone. It's definitely a purple. Purple drink. Purple drink. <laughs> I don't know what is in this purple oh, drink. Hey, it was good. Uh, I wouldn't crush it or make one for myself, but I'll be damned if it wasn't a really tasty drink. Uh, I did appreciate the lower ABV. I think that's kind of a neat thing when, you know, when I drink mead, I sort of expect them to be more wine like uh, uh, upwards of, you know, 12 to 14 percent alcohol. Uh, so so that was kind of neat. I sort of see what the guys were saying about the spiciness. There was there, there was this just subtle little hint of a cinnamon like flavor. I didn't really get clove, uh, but I'm guessing maybe it came from the yeast. So I got to I got to ask, was it carbonated? I think it was slightly carbonated. Uh, what do they call it? Petalant? Um, yeah, I, I don't recall specifically, though. 
So it's not gonna it's not gonna take over for your uh, cider on tap all the time. No, but 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 it did inspire me. Blueberries are a fruit I've never really played with in brewing, and the color of this melomel was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I've got plans to make a blueberry hard cider soon. I just saw that Costco's carrying the frozen blueberries, kind of similar as the cherries that I've used in the past and the the mixed berries. So, uh, yeah, I, I expect to see a blueberry hard cider at some point. I will not be making a melomel. Hey, thanks so much for sending uh, your melomel in. Paul, if you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage reviewed by Jersey and Tim, email me, marshall at brewlosophy.com, and we'll get you all set up. All right, we'll be back right after this short break. So I've been hanging out with brewers and craft beer nerds for a long time now. And while we do occasionally have our differences, one thing it seems we all share is a love of learning and trying new things, as well as saving a couple of bucks. Well, right now, Craft Beer and Brewing is helping fans of Brewlosophy learn more while saving some coin by offering 20% off the price of a subscription to their awesome magazine. Chock full of brewing insights, tips, and recipes from industry experts, Craft Beer and Brewing is seriously great. I read every issue page to page myself. To get 20% off your subscription. All you have to do is sign up at beerandbrewing.com slash brewlosophy. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the super fast counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Accelerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. When dumping wort-soaked grain in leftover low-gravity wort while cleaning up after a brew day, do you ever wonder what your true efficiency would be if that wort made its way to the kettle instead? Using the brew bag, a fabric filter for all mash tuns and brewing methods, allows you to capture every last drop of wort. Not only does this increase kettle efficiency, it lowers your grain bill, which saves you money. Throwing wort in the trash is like dumping a 12-pack down the drain and just doesn't make sense. Use the brew bag and leave no wort behind. I've been using these filters for a long time and recommend them to everyone. I never have to worry about a stuck sparge and cleanup is fast and easy. Go grab yourself a brew bag fabric filter at brewinabag.com and be sure to use code TBP17 at checkout to get a discount on your order. Just as the Grain Father all-in-one brewing system revolutionized all grain brewing at home, the Grain Father conical fermenter and glycol chiller take this one step further by giving home brewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. With a full array of features including insulated double-walled construction, an innovative dual-valve yeast stump and sampling tap, and an integrated heating element and temperature controller, the conical fermenter provides a perfect professional quality fermenting environment for superior temperature control. With the ability to individually power and control the temperature of up to four Grainfather conical fermenters, each with their own fermenting schedule, the Grainfather glycol chiller is the perfect addition to ensure superior fermenting results. And for a limited time, you can save 10% on your order by going to Grainfather.com and entering coupon code NZB during checkout. Once again, enter coupon code NZB when you order the Grainfather conical fermenter or glycol chiller at grainfather.com once again that's grainfather.com I'm dead serious when I say that carbonation is one of my favorite aspects of beer, even when it comes to styles that are known for being served less bubbly, uh, like English beers. I just like carbonation. These days, forced carbonation makes it fairly easy to control the level of carbonation in beer, though it wasn't terribly long ago. Brewers had to rely on more natural methods, one of which is spunding. When we talk about spunding or bunging, um, I guess it kind of depends on where you came up. Uh, in, in terms of the style guidelines, basically it's just the practice of closing the fermentation bucket with remnant extract um, to produce a sort of natural carbonation. So, I um, you know, many home brewers bottle condition their beers. This is very similar to what the concept of spunding is. You know, you put the beer in the bottle with sugar in it, cap it, it allows it to carbonate and that CO2 can't go anywhere. 
That's the same thing as spunding, except what we're doing is taking that remnant extract in the beer, capping that off and allowing that to produce natural carbonation. So, um, you know, how, how, how was this done? What's the history behind this? Uh, really, it's probably been going on for, you know, hundreds of years. Um, right. Forced carbonation didn't really exist in, until recent history. Um, so in order for beer to be served, not still, uh, it had to be uh, naturally carbonated uh, in some way. So in Britain, what was common was the fermented beer was allowed to be fined in a cask. Um, and, and then in reading some brew logs from, uh, from Ron Pattinson's website, um, I, I noted that uh, what brewers would do is add either high-gravity sugar solution or even high-gravity wort uh, to that cask after it was all uh, done and fined, um, and, then, and then cap it and allow it to lightly carbonate uh, as it was on its way to the pub to be served. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. One of the things about spunding that I find really appealing is that, uh, one, you're you're utilizing, uh, you know, naturally produced CO2, for one, uh, and and you're, you're carbonating naturally without the addition of something else. And so to me, there, there's, there's, uh, there's appeal in the fact that you don't have to say, open up your, you know, whatever it is that you're carbonating in to add sugar or, or, you know, other sort of priming solution. Yeah, exactly. Um, of all the things we do in, in the, the home brewery or, or even the commercial brewery, um, spunding is probably one of the more environmentally friendly things. Right. Um, I think producing CO2 in a commercial sense is somewhat waste, waste, uh, intensive, um, uh, in, in capturing that CO2 and, and reusing it. Um, it's definitely something that cuts down on the environmental footprint of brewing for yeah. sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you, you were saying you, you read up a little bit on, uh, on, uh, Ron Pattinson's blog. That's shut up about Barkley Perkins. Uh, great blog, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it is, do we know much about the history of spending? Uh, it, that, that is a German term. So I'm assuming it kind of got started there or maybe that's where it, I'm, I, well, I'm assuming it was happening everywhere for people who enjoyed carbonated beer. I don't get me wrong, but, um, but it seems like, given what it's called, that there's got, it's got roots in uh, in Germany, right? Yeah. So the the term spunding itself, which is interchangeable with bunging, um, b u n g i n g, um, th th those refer to the same practice. And I I have to assume, um, just based on the lack of, um, you know, historical innovation that I could find related to this practice, that it that it has been going on for hundreds of years back back towards. Um, you know, you know, pre-recorded time, but right. yeah, in Germany, the practice of spunding, um, really the reason they've probably been doing this forever uh, is due to the German purity law. Um, so the only things you can add to beer are water, hops, and grain. I mean, no yeast. Um, so, so with the fact that they can't add any CO2, uh, to their beer bunging of fermentation, you know, in casks or in the, in the lager tank to allow it to slowly carbonate at those lower temperatures over the months of aging, um, was really a way to get those beers fizzy to the consumer. Right. Um, in a more modern sense, the, the, the practice of bunging seem or spunding seems to have somewhat gone away. Um, um in reading some brew logs, um, and some history about this, it seems that, uh, the practice of croisoning, which is pulling already fermenting beer uh, from a different fermentation tank um, and putting it into the lager tank uh, with the still beer um, with, with a certain percentage of remaining extract left uh, is really the practice that's going on now since it's uh, it's more precise and, and yields better results, it's thought. It would seem to me as well, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back before there were pressure gauges, you know, accurate pressure gauges and whatnot, that spunding, um, you know, when you, when you cap off a tank that is actively fermenting, you run the risk, even if you can measure, uh, you know, a, a presumed a specific gravity, you know, and, and, and we'll talk about how to, how to go about spunding more modern, modern day here in a bit, but I would imagine that croisoning and uh, even utilizing something like a pre-measured priming solution, uh, that there was an element of safety to that that you don't capture when just bunging a, a firm fermentation tank. Uh, I, I have to wonder how many tanks ex ended up exploding because a beer, <laughs> you know, maybe maybe was a little bit more attenuative than they expected, or uh, you know, something like that. I mean, we have to presume it's happened because I've been to breweries before when people are brewing and. You know, like some of them are, you know, fairly professional, but there are definitely others where the the head brewmaster or whoever's brewing for the day has had a few 
Um, and, and you can just imagine somebody going through there and saying, oh, this looks ready and yeah. shutting it off. And then a day and a half later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's close this puppy down and uh, have a nice carbonated beer tomorrow. Next thing you know, you show up to a you know, foam mountain, I'm sure. Right, right. So let's talk a little bit about more modern approaches to spunding. Uh, you know, and maybe what we can start with is, is what a spunding valve is. I think a lot of people have probably heard that term. I'm not sure many people actually have a spunding valve. Uh, perhaps you could kind of walk us through a little bit of, of just how to build one of these things, what it makes up, uh, and how to use it. Right. So a spunding valve, uh, as we use them today, is essentially a pressure relief valve that's adjustable to a specific PSI that you want. Um, there are quite a few guides online, uh, as well as some pre-built ones uh, that you can buy um, in, in terms of how to build one with some commonly available parts. Um, m- most of the parts are you know, simple plumber's parts that you can find at Home Depot or Ace. Yeah. Um, so basically, it's some sort of connector to the flare off of a, a, a quick disconnect to some sort of a T-valve, which you would attach a pressure gauge to so that you can um, accurately, accurately read what your pressure relief valve is letting out. And then that pressure relief valve, um, which allows you to adjust it to a certain PSI. And that PSI is going to be different depending on uh, what level of carbonation you want, as well as what the temperature is um, that you're carbonating at. Yeah. So, so just speaking about the valve itself, it is a, it is a, a pretty rudimentary, um, you know, product that is that works in in my experience surprisingly well. Um, I, again, I I haven't spunded a a keg for carbonation or anything, but I've certainly played with the two that I've built. I think to all together, I was able to build two of these things for something like thirty bucks. Um, you can buy them online pre-built. It's all, they look exactly the same and uh, as the ones that you're going to make yourself. They're probably all made with the same exact materials. I think online you're going to get one for about 25 30 bucks, something like that. Yeah, that sounds about right. And, and they do work very well. Um, essentially, the pressure relief valve on these is just a spring uh, that, that pushes a, a sort of rubber stopper up against the tubing. Um, and you set that spring to a specific tension. Um, and that tension allows CO2 out once it's built up to that certain pressure. Yeah. W- one thing to note is, uh, you know, Jake, you mentioned a, a quick relief or quick disconnect. All we're talking about is, is a gas uh, disconnect that you would put on a, a standard homebrew, you know, corny keg. Uh, you know, we're, we've never built one uh, for, on the commercial scale, but I'm sure there are, they're just as easy to make. Uh, uh, the, the thing about them is you have to get the, the quick disconnect with the MFL, right? With the, with the flare fitting that you can screw screw onto something so that uh, you can't use the barbed fitting to make one of these things. No, I mean, I think you could probably adapt a spunding valve to fit off a barb, sure. but um, I mean, might as well just go with the flare. Yeah. Yeah. It's easier, I think. So you've got your spunding valve. Uh, it's all built. There's no leaks. <laughs> you also want to use a lot of the, uh, a lot of uh, uh, plumber's tape or the, the gas gas tape for these things I've found. Uh, otherwise they will leak. Uh, but you got your spunding, ba- spunding valve built. Uh, walk us through how you uh, use yours. Right. So um, if, you're, if you're doing specifically the practice of spunding where you want to use that remnant extract in your beer to naturally carbonate the beer, uh, you're going to have to take your beer from its fermentation vessel, unless your vessel can hold pressure, take it into a keg um, with specific gravity points left. Uh, typically, we like to think that about one Play-Doh, which is four SG points, um, is what it takes to carbonate up a beer to the appropriate level. Um, there are calculators online. It could be give or take a few. Um, so we'll rack that into the keg with specific, gra- specific gravity points left, close that keg up. Um, if you're using pinlock kegs, you might need to apply some CO2 just to seat uh, the lid on that, and then attach your spunding valve, which is on the quick disconnect to the gas out and make sure it's the gas out because if it's on the liquid, uh, <laughs> this is where pin lock have... comes in very handy when, when you're drinking and spunding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so attach that spunding valve to your gas disconnect. Um, you're going to want to use a calculator online or, or, uh, some sort of graph that shows you what PSI or sorry, what, you know, pressure you're going to need at a specific temperature to reach the volumes you want. Um, so if you're, if you're taking that keg and putting it in, um, you know, 90 degree garage, you're going to need a different PSI to carbonate that than if you put it in a 60 degree basement. Um, so figure out your volumes, set the spunding valve to that specific pressure. And it does help to um, carbonate that headspace up. I found to about 20 PSI. 
Um, so then when you put that spunding valve on there, it'll pop up to 20 and you can adjust it down to where it's just leaking at that specific PSI that you need. Oh, I see. So you, so you, you hit the headspace of the keg, uh, which like you said earlier, could, could also serve the purpose of seating your lid, but you hit it with about 20 PSI from your tank and then put the spunding valve on it and let it bleed out until it gets to your set PSI. Yeah, so basically I close the spunding valve all the way so that it's letting nothing out, basically. Um, seat the lid, get a bunch of um, head pressure on that, attach the spunding valve, and then just back it off until it gets to the specific PSI that I want. Okay, cool. Yeah, that it makes sense. Nice. Then you just let that beer sit in your keg for a bit until the um, you know pressure gauge goes up to its specific PSI that it needs. Um, let it sit for a few days or however long it takes. Uh, to continue fermenting out um, and once that's done you can rack into a different serving keg if you want um, you will need to put some sort of back pressure onto the new keg um, in order to not have a foaming disaster uh, <laughs> or you can just serve right from that keg just drop it in your keyser no need to carbonate uh, it's ready to drink so what do you do do you, do you serve straight from the keg that you you carbonate in or uh, I've always done that. Yeah, I've never transferred it again. It seems like that that would be the way to go. I, I would imagine though that if you've got f you know four Plato or you know f or I'm sorry one uh, one degree Plato right so so four degrees or, or four SG points left uh, that y there's still some yeast in suspension. Obviously, it's got to ferment the rest of the beer. Do you get uh, you know a, a a fairly decent amount of yeast or trube that you're pulling off uh, on those first few pours or? I mean, I don't cold crash and fermentation vessels, so I'd say it's about the same. So it's about the same. And, and, and that yeah. will pull off. One of the things that I've been concerned with, and this leads to my next question about uh, another kind of what seems to me to be a very uh, convenient approach to, to doing all of this. Um, I've always been concerned that maybe the dip tube in my keg won't be, I guess, the diameter is, is small enough to where it, it'll, it'll get clogged with if there's just too much yeast in there. Yeah. <laughs> I've not had that happen. Uh, I presume if maybe you pull up a bunch of trub that's say, sorry, trube that's say uh, hot matter, this could definitely happen. Um, I do modify my dip tubes slightly so they rest on the side of the keg versus the bottom. Sure. But um, I've not had that happen yet. I, I assume it could though. So what about uh, what about the person who's who's you know, listening to this and saying, well, hey, what if I just rack my wort directly to a keg? pitch my yeast into there, let it ferment out, throw a spunding valve on, you know, right towards the end. Or, or I guess you suppose you could just do it whenever you want and then just tighten down that, uh, that pressure relief valve uh, to, to wherever it needs to go based on the calculator. Uh, and, then, and then once it's carbonated, you know, go throw that in the, go throw that bad boy in the, in the keyser and serve directly from the fermentation keg. Yeah, so I think basically what you're describing is like a pressurized ferment uh, served straight from that keg. And I think a lot of people do this, especially in the homebrew realm. Um, I know with with the um, you know popularity that we've seen lately of of unit tanks. I think this is a very similar concept to that. Uh, corny keg can be used as a unit tank. Yeah. Um, just throw your wort in there, ferment it, spund it, and then just serve it. Um, I think Matt Del Fiaco, um, our fellow contributor, has done that you know quite a few times. And I don't think in talking with him, he's ever noticed any sort of um, common concerns that we would expect, you know, autolysis or sure. um, vegetal matter from leftover hops or anything like that. Yeah. And, and, and in the brewing process, I mean, you can take steps just to minimize any potential risk. Uh, you can bag your kettle hops, you know, you can, uh, if you're going to dry hop, you can, you can, you know, dry hop. And I, I guess, I guess dry hopping would actually be kind of difficult if you're using this approach, but, um, you can definitely take steps to do it. That's something I really want to try. Uh, another, another cool tip that, that I just thought of that I saw a few people talking about after you, uh, published the results of the experiment we're going to talk about in a bit is, uh, people who are saying, well, if you're fermenting in a keg like that w before you spun, why not, uh, basically make a, your, your blow off tube connect to the gas post and then have that connect to the, to the, uh, a filled, a keg filled with sanitizer and then uh, have the gas from your fermenting keg basically push that sanitizer out of the other keg and use 
naturally created CO2 basically to purge a second keg. Uh, something I absolutely am interested in trying. I think it's easy enough. Yeah, I think that's a really um, you know elegant solution to, to purging kegs. You're producing so much CO2 during a normal fermentation of beer. Yeah. Um, and finding a way to repurpose that, to use it to purge another keg. Um, because, you know, we've done a few experiments on purging kegs and it does seem to do something. Sure. Yeah. I think that's an awesome, awesome way to use that CO2. Yeah. Well, and the the idea came up because somebody was saying and then, you know, so and I guess you don't even have to do it from you don't even have to be fermenting in a in a keg to start. You could do it with pretty much any fermenter where the uh, the the airlock bung isn't going to pop out because of any back pressure, you know, any pressure from pushing the water out of the keg. But um, the reason that came up is somebody was saying, well, then now you've got a nicely purged keg, all purged with natural CO2 that you can then rack the, you know, one Plato left beer into and use natural CO2 to carbonate, really just eliminate the need for uh, you know, store-bought, st- store-bought gas. Yeah, until you need to serve the last third of the keg or so. <laughs> Is that what? In, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> you I, you would definitely need you know some CO two to push that out, I guess, but right. still far less than than is needed for uh, carbonation and and uh, you know uh, CO two purging a keg. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's very cool, and it's something that I want to rig up a system to do. I just haven't done that yet. Yeah, I'm the same. And you you had mentioned how much you know that a ton of CO two is produced during the fermentation process, I, I, I think it's something like 40 times the volume of the beer that you're fermenting is produced in CO2. Something crazy high like that. So in essence, we're, we, we, are, we are wasting, uh, you know, a, a, a probably a five pound tank of CO2 every time we ferment a beer. Something like that. Something around there is, is what I've been told. So yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the pros and the cons of spending. We've we've hit on a few. Uh, obviously, the, in my mind, the biggest one is no need for external CO two for carbonation, which is easily the most uh, uh, where I lose the most carbonation is when I'm you know burst carving or or uh, trying to you know put some bubbles in one of my beers. Right. And and that trip to the homebrew store to get that filled up or or the local gas supply store is always annoying. I yeah. mean, it never happens at a good time. You it never, never happens at, right at a time. good time. Yeah, it's always like right ten minutes before your party's about to start. All the places are closed. You got to call all your friends to see if they have any left. Yep. Um, also, another pro, you know, that some have talked about is it does reduce reduce that uh, risk of uh, packaging oxygen. Yep. Um, so you think about it, you're packaging a beer that has active yeast in it, um, as well as some sort of um, extract left. So presumably, as this yeast is taking up that extract. Uh, it's all, it's also converting some of that oxygen into energy. So, well, and if you're and if you're racking the, you know, uh, not quite finished fermenting beer into a CO two purged keg, which I guess you don't even really need to do that. But uh, presumably, uh, you know, that fermentation is going to use the oxygen that is present in that vessel uh, and and essentially scrub it from uh, the beer and the vessel itself. So you you are, and, and then you're capping it off, you know, with, with a spunding valve. Uh, yeah, it seems to me like it would really uh, reduce the risk of oxidation. Right. And I think on, on our uh, scale, especially, you know, the fact that our volumes are so small, um, but the surface area is so large in comparison uh, something like this really uh, could probably have a big effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, another another thing that I've heard from some people, and this has to do with just natural carbonation in general, but that um, that by by spunding or or by by naturally carbonating, even with priming sugar, they'll say that you get a, a finer, more refined bubble, basically a creamier head, just an all around better experience with the fizz. Uh, you know, I, I can't say that I've ever noticed that, but it's what people seem to talk about right and people do and i think i don't know i think naturally carbonated bottle beer that have those super fine bubbles tend to be more highly carbonated and and i i kind of wonder if that just lends itself to having those finer smaller bubbles with that creamier head but i don't know i think it's something that we really should dive into a little bit more and then one last pro um, that i've heard a lot of people talk about um, is the fact that when you're spunding this, a certain amount of CO2 in your beer is never allowed to escape. So it stays in that beer and it's not pulling off aromatic compounds with it, you know, as you're fermenting and losing that CO2. Hmm. 
Um, so people have thought or or have posited that that uh, leads to you know a better aroma when you open that glass because those aroma compounds have never blown off, um, and to some extent flavor, which. Eh, maybe, but it'd be <laughs> yeah. fun to test out. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's that's like deep dive material there. I I, I don't know about that, but uh, it's certainly interesting. I guess especially for people that brew nipas. I mean, yeah, maybe I, every last bit you can get. Well, well, you know, let we'll go over some cons uh, of spunding, but I do think that there are some specific styles that would benefit more from this than others, perhaps. But uh, another thing that I've heard, and I. I use a lot of store-bought CO2. I get it at a welding store. <laughs> so, uh, but there are folks out there who swear that 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 you know CO2 has a flavor uh, that it that it and, and that when you carbonate when you force carbonate a beer, not necessarily that is bad, but but that you are also imparting whatever the flavor of of the CO2 in the tank has. Uh, again, I'm not sure that that's even real. But by spunding, you you eliminate the risk of getting that even if it is. So a right. uh, couple of the downsides that I've heard, I think the biggest one for spending is just that it's, it's, it's typically a new process for people. And so uh, even if it's not as complicated, it might feel a little bit more complicated at first. You do have to do some racking and, and, uh, and whatnot. Yeah. It does make the brewing process more involved. Um, you know, and, and as I've gotten older and um, now I'm on kid number two, I think, since last time we talked. <laughs> yeah. I just don't have time to sit there and monitor my fermentation vessels and see, all right, is it one plate or left? But, yeah. you know, luckily that pressure relief valve, it does work. So it's not like a traditional, like, 1800s brewery here where, you know, if we spun it too early, we're going to have an exploding barrel. Um, you know, we could spun it with, you know, I don't know, three plate or left. And then just let that spunding valve do its work. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Is, is there a um, is there like a max volumes of of carbonation of CO two that that spunding valves will, um, I, I guess, carbonate a beer to? Or well, it would depend on your pressure relief valve and whatever yeast can actually handle um, in terms of CO two toxicity. Um, I think those corny kegs are rated to one fifty. Yeah, those know. things can hold a lot of pressure. So yeah, so I don't I don't know. Um, what would happen to the yeast as you started to get over, um, you know, say 100 psi? I don't know what the volumes would translate to on that. Yeah, I guess the only other thing I can think of con wise is that you have to get a spunding valve, which is you know it's not a big deal. They're pretty cheap to build, but it is another piece of gear. Uh, most of us nerdy brewers sort of like that kind of thing. Uh, well, I, you know, one thing you mentioned earlier that that we haven't really hit on much is this fear of autolysis. I personally. Don't think that given how fresh yeast is nowadays, regardless of where you get it from, it's so much better than it used to be. Uh, if, if that yeast is sitting at the bottom of your beer for uh, two to three months uh, max, typically for a five gallon batch, I, I just don't think you're going to yeast are going to die off and, and start you know exploding and making your beer taste bad. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, I think eventually it would happen. Like if, say, you spun it a beer and just let it sit in your keyser for maybe three or four years. I mean, but yeah. I don't, I don't know when that's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think autolysis is, is something to worry about necessarily. Now, some yeast, in my experience, this is completely anecdotal, do seem to have kind of their own flavor, and uh, perhaps that could become an issue. I'm not a big fan of the flavor of, of just yeast. So, uh, but again, they, they make these neat, you know, the, the clear beer draft system, which, which Jake, I know you use, uh, these, they're kind of floaters that you install on your kegs so that you're pulling beer from the top and not from the bottom. That seems like a really, uh, easy way to avoid, you know, the, any, any yeast derived flavors. Uh, if you, if you are going to do kind of a, a spunded keg or, or even if you're, even if you're fermenting and serving from the same keg. Right. Um, you, you know, not to to plug, um, you know, that brand specifically, but any sort of floating dip tube works so well in synergy with uh, a spunning valve on the homebrew scale. So basically what that does is it replaces your liquid out um, and just floats at the top. So then after your spunning's all done, you throw it in your keyser, let all that remnant yeast settle out and you're just pulling clear beer, you know, right away. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Uh, all right, real quick, before we start talking about the experiment that you did, are there specific styles that you would say uh, benefit from spending more than others? I know, you know, from my reading and from, from what I've heard other people talk about that, that, you know, loggers, particularly German style loggers, uh, that have a, a very special flavor <laughs> characteristic to them, apparently, uh, really do benefit from this process. 
Right. If you, if you don't spawn your loggers, they will never, ever have it. <laughs> oh, so I, I know you know what it is. I, I don't know if I do, actually, <laughs> man. Uh, no. Um, I think traditionally um, spawning has been used a lot with loggers um, in British beers, um, at least with the recorded history that we have. Uh, I presume that people have been doing these practices you know, you know, long before that. Um, and, I, and I really think any beer that you're willing to bottle condition, you should be willing to spund. It seems easier to me than bottle conditioning personally. Um, and I think I, it seems easier than kegging almost. <laughs> yeah, I don't, that's, that's, see, I'm, I'm, the reason I, I mentioned that it's just a, a novel process and that can be kind of complicated. There's a reason, and I've not consciously thought of this, but there's a reason I've not spunded yet. I've got these two perfectly working valves that have just never been used, um, and, you know, and and why not it, if it's so simple? But there's something holding me back from doing it. I think it's just that it's new. It's it's this thing that I feel like I'm oh I have to learn how to use this thing properly. Uh, I I'm also sort of turned off a little bit by the idea of having to check. Um, you know, my final gravity. And I know uh, one way to one way to know what the final gravity is going to be of a beer uh, that we failed to mention so far is by doing a forced fermentation test. Uh, we're going to talk about that when we talk about the experiment, which is exactly what we are going to get to when we're back from the short break. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code Brewpod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Hi, I'm Stephen Leach, creator of Brow Supply Brewing Systems, here to tell you about our latest Unibrow Brewing System. Modeled after the brew in a bag method, the Unibrow uses the same kettle for both mashing and boiling, replacing the fabric bag with a stainless basket that can hold up to 20 pounds of grain. A heating element is run by an electric controller that allows for the maintenance of specific mash temperatures and makes mashing easier than ever. Each Unibrow is shipped with a counterflow chiller and the parts required to brew a batch of beer. We're really proud of the Unibrow, and we know you'll love it as much as we do. Go check it out at BrowSupply.com and sign up for our email list to receive special deals in your inbox. As a lover of traditional lager styles, Jake, you'd started messing around uh, with spunding and eventually decided to see how it compares with forced carbonation and experiment. Right, so uh, spunding had been something I'd tried out a few times Um to pretty awesome results just in terms of the fact that I had carbonated beer faster, um, which I know as a lover of the burst carbonated method uh, is something you would fully get behind Marshall. Uh, <laughs> I got to try it, man. I'm not, I, I got to stop resisting. Right. Uh, so I decided to brew up a 10 gallon batch of a German Hellas export beer, uh, which used to be called, uh, you know, the, the Dortmunder export. Um, I, I chose this style of beer just because of the fact that, you know, it leaves a little bit less to hide behind. Um, I know some people will probably say you should have chosen an IPA because those can oxidize faster. But um, you know, I, I like to I like to use a, a Hellas type beer. 
um, for these very subtle or what we presume will be subtle type experiments. Yeah, well, um, and and arguably, uh, you know, spunding wasn't originally used on New England IPA. So right, yeah. I mean, we have we have history behind us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so so I made up a simple grist here um, with a with a portion of pale two row uh, as well as pilsner malt, a uh, decent charge of Vienna, and then some cara foam, which I was trying to use up from that cara foam experiment at the time, uh, and then cara hell. Uh, I did a, a simple Brunebag full volume circulated mash for 155 degrees uh, uh, for 60 minutes and then boiled it with small charges of Magnum and Saws. Now, uh, just uh, just for our international listeners, 155 degrees Fahrenheit is 68 degrees Celsius. Make oh, sure sorry. We, make sure we throw yes, that in there. 68C. That, uh, that allows me to not, um, you know, have to respond to a million emails. <laughs> right. Well, I'll do a nice conversion here for you. Um, I targeted a 1053, which is 13 Play-Doh port. Oh, fancy. Um, and achieved that. I know I've been taking notes from Malcolm. <laughs> Our professional brewing contributor now. Right. Uh, since this was one of those experiments where the variable would be introduced post-boil, um, I just did one single mash, one single boil to keep everything as consistent as possible. Mm -hmm. um, they were then split into two uh, separate SS brew buckets um, and pitched with a single starter of harvest yeast, I believe. Yeah, that's the um, Imperial's L17, one of my favorites. Great yeast. Um, so then this is kind of where the work started for this for this specific experiment because we want it to be as exact as possible. Um, going forward, I'll, I'll kind of explain why I don't really do this anymore. Um, but what we did, you know, for the purposes of this test is we, we completed a forced fermentation test, which is essentially making a, uh, a yeast starter. So I took some of the leftover beer from my kettle uh, after the fermentation buckets had been filled um, put that in a sanitized flask, pitch some of that harvest yeast, and let that spin on my stir plate for about a day and a half. And um, you and okay, so you let it spin because you wanted to encourage the fastest attenuation possible. Uh, it, this is this is what I was presuming. Um, I, I, yeah, I let it spin to knock out the CO two after it was done fermenting, so okay. that I would get an accurate reading. Um, but it does. Uh, you know, you know, allow it to speed up fermentation. Yeah. Um, you could do this without a stir plate. You could just take some leftover wort from your kettle, pitch a little bit of yeast, uh, put it in a growler with the stopper on it or some foil, just shake it around, you know? Yeah. So you, and now the, the beers were fermenting at 48 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, you did the forced fermentation test warmer again. Uh, it, the hopes being to, you wanted this. You wanted to know what the FG was going to be before the beers that were fermenting got close to FG, right? Because you because you needed to know where to cut it off uh, or where to spun these uh, these these beers. Exactly. So, um, if we're going to spun with one Plato left or four SG left, we need to know what the final gravity is. Um, so, a forced fermentation test is pretty good. Um, it's a pretty good tool for helping you know what your final gravity is, whether whether or not you're worried about stuck fermentations um, or doing a practice like this, doing a forced fermentation test should theoretically allow you to know what the potential of that yeast with your specific wort is in terms of a final gravity. I mean, it seems ideal to me, yeah. Yeah, so it's a very useful tool um, for, for various aspects in the brewery. So, uh, at, so at one with three days after you pitched the yeast into the beers, uh, there, you know, there was obviously activity, uh, that I, I believe you, you split a starter or something like that. Um, so at three days in you took a, um, well, well, what was the, what was the finishing gravity of the, of the forced fermentation test beer? Right. So the forced fermentation test, uh, beer turned out to 1015 SG, um, at that 1015 SG, that would mean if I was going to keg up the beer to be spunded. Uh, one Plato above that, or four degrees, uh, four specific gravity points. Sorry, um, <laughs> that would mean I would have to keg it up at ten nineteen. Um, so I took hydrometer measurements quite often, um, <laughs> probably more than I've ever done before. It was see, that's what I would hate about this. That's the one big drawback well, I think for me. See, the thing is, I only did them, you know, like that because I was doing it for an experiment. Sure. Um, in real practice, I, I think you could be a little less neurotic about it. Um, so I took a ton of hydrometer readings. Finally, it showed 1020. Uh, I figured that was close enough. So I racked the the one batch into the keg, attached the spunding valve, set it to PSI of uh, 15. 
which as the temperature rose to about 60 would allow for the volumes of carbonation that I was looking for. Um, I also, or sorry, I set the spunding valve to 22 PSI to get me um, the volumes I wanted at 60 degrees. Uh, the other beer was uh, kegged after the fermentation was finished on that one. Now you let um, the the spunded the the spunded one there the the you put it back in the 48 degree Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius chamber next to the other beer that was finishing fermenting but at that point you started to gently ramp up the temperature to 60 degrees fahrenheit or 16 c uh and then once it got to 60 you set it to 22 psi and that was all based on some calculator or chart that you referenced yeah so i just kegged the one that was going to be spunded set it to 15 psi which at the specific temperature it was at um, would produce the volumes i wanted put it back in there, let the other beer finish up. And then as I began raising it to 60, I tightened up um, that spunning valve a little bit to get it to the volumes it needed to be at. Gotcha. Because at warmer temperature, more CO2 comes out of solution. Yeah. It won't absorb uh, as readily as as whatever. Okay. So uh, you, you, once fermentation activity was done, you took another set of hydrometer measurements and lo and behold, your force ferment test was accurate. Uh, both beers finished at 1015 FG. I know. It's uh, it's always satisfying. When so satisfying like when numbers align. <laughs> Gosh. Um, so, so after that was all done, I, uh, I racked the beer that was to be force carbonated into a keg. Um, since the other beer had already fermented out to its FG, I pulled off the spunding valve um, and put that one in the keyser as well and let them lager for a long two months. So traditional of you, Jake. <laughs> Jeez. Two months of lagering. I do. You did skip any sort of fining, um, which I, you know, I, t- t- you know, Ray refers to uh, gelatin as as uh, powdered time. I, I refer to it as, you know, powdered lager because <laughs> I think it it pretty much does the same thing. A test uh, must be done with this, um, but, right? But also, also one of the you know purported benefits of spunding is the fact that your beer doesn't really see oxygen from the time it's kegged until the time it's consumed. So if I were to open up those kegs and add that gelatin, I would be introducing an amount of oxygen. Sure. Um, Sure. They're not that significant. I don't know. Yeah. No, I agree. Keep Uh, keep all those equal. Yeah. And and the other thing is, um, so, you know, the force carbonated beer, you racked that into a CO2 purge keg. Yes. Right. Yeah. Always. Okay. So, so that one ostensibly saw a, a very small amount if any oxygen itself. So, so these beers in essence, before you serve them, before you started doing uh, some data collection, they, they were pretty similar with the exception of one was spunded and the other wasn't. Uh, what did they end up looking like? The finished beers? I, I would have expected the spunded beer in all seriousness. I, I would have thought it would be hazier uh, than the, than the force carbonated beer. Yeah. I, I think because of the fact that I keg warm, um, they both looked identical throughout the entire process. Um, if you look at the pictures that I took, on the website, um, at the time this beer was served to participants, it's a it's a very pretty beer. They're both basically glass, um, you know, crystal clear. You can read a book through them. Yeah, they do look identical. I, I would have expected differences in foam. I would in so many things, but uh, at this point, I'm sort of presuming. Oh boy, you know, m- maybe there maybe there really is no difference. Uh, tell us about your ability uh, to 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 pick apart these beers. What did you think uh, these beers tasted like? Right. So like with every batch, you know, I started drinking this one fairly early in the process. And I I don't think initially I could taste much. I know, like you said, you get that yeast flavor when there's still yeast in suspension, especially for lagers. Yeah. I think that's kind of all I tasted for a bit. Once they cleared up and I started doing, you know, more focused triangle tests, I was consistently able to identify the uh, force carbonated beer out. It had this honey gram like aroma um, that I could just initially pick up like, you know, just smell one, smell one, smell one. Boom! These two are are honey grams. Um, so you it, you had mentioned that that the force carbonated beer had this kind of honey gram character, and that that character just wasn't in the spunded beer, or as strong at least in the in the spunded beer for you. What what was? I mean, what did the spunded did the spunded beer have any kind of uh, distinct characteristics to it? No, I mean it just tasted like beer, like Hellas. That sounds really good, actually. (laughs) A a beer that tastes like beer. Imagine that. Holy shit. I don't think either of them would have tasted bad on their own. And I think the, 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 the force carbonated beer is a familiar taste. It's not something, um, you know, that that's outside the realm of what I would normally brew at home. Sure. But when I had it next to the spunded beer, I was like, wow, these are different enough that 
I think I like the Splendid one more. Huh. And, huh. and because I knew like what flavor was associated which, with which of the beers, I had that bias in my head that once I could pick it out, I was like, oh, well, I like this one better. Of course. Which is the yeah. Splendid one. Yeah. I don't yeah. know why because it's more work. But. <laughs> because it's more traditional, man. I know. I'm, I'm a sucker for that. Uh, all right. Well, you went along and you served uh, these beers to 22 participants, out of which 12 would uh, need to identify the odd beer out in order for us to say that it was significant. Uh, how many actually did select the odd beer out in, in, in your series of tests? So, so in this uh, series of tests, we had 12 people identify it. So that is exactly the threshold for um, significance. Uh, so we can say with some degree of confidence at a p-value of 0 0.05 that uh, these beers were reliably different. Um, in terms of the preference data, five preferred the force carbonated beer more, two preferred the spunded, uh, and then three had no preference and two noted no difference. Yeah. So Pretty, pretty wide split there. Yeah, um, well, I mean, five against two for the force carb versus spunded. Uh, you know, you are among the minority in this one, Jake, <laughs> which I, I am. Is, but but again, we don't tell them what the style is. We don't tell them what to look for. Sure. And, um, yeah. You know, I mean, five versus two people. I'm, I'm confident in saying I have better palates than those five people. <laughs> They're wrong. I'm You're just right. kidding. Yeah. Well, uh, I, at the very least, I think what this results, uh, what these results kind of tell tell to me is that spunding appears to, to have some impact on beer character. It may not be as drastic or, uh, uh, you know, as preferable, at, you know, objectively at least, um, uh, as, as some might assume. But it does seem like it, it may actually impact beer, or, or maybe better put, that forced carbonation. Uh, is, is what has the impact and, and spunding is almost more natural. But um, I think it's interesting, probably a good way to use naturally produced CO2 to carbonate beer uh, rather than, than wasting money on refilling tanks all the time. I, uh, any other implications you can think of? No, um, you know, I think it was very cool that these came back as significant. You know, it opens up so many more questions. Like you said, was it the CO2? Is there something about that process of getting this commercial CO2 that, leaches some flavor from something um, and maybe that causes a difference or could it have been you know you know a difference of oxidation of these finished beers yeah I mean, we don't know more tests are definitely required for this one and uh, I for one am excited to do them uh, I still haven't tried spunding myself but I plan to at some point um, I've had some spunded beers in the past and I found them to be totally fine I didn't notice them uh, being different there was nothing off about them um, I just got to get you know, I got to get the courage, I guess, to, to try this new thing out. All right, we're going to move on to some reader comments. The first one comes from Tony LeClaire. Uh, he says, Spunding, I feel silly thinking that I invented fermented interruptus. <laughs> After repeated batches with the same dark lager and S23 yeast, that's saff lager, uh, I'd bottle at 1018 or 1019 SG and am confident of four points of carbonation. Since you've introduced me to it, I'll certainly reference this as spunding in the future. Thanks for all you do. Wow, that guy has some balls. He is <laughs> bottle conditioning beer. It sounds terrifying left. to me, man. <laughs> God. Oh, I, would, I would not recommend that, nor would I do that. Well, you know, his fermented interruptus method sounds to be, you know, working. Um, I, 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 it, it, I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, I, that's where I would probably, uh, not probably, if I was going to do this, I would definitely do a forced ferment test just yes. so I feel a little bit more confident at, at you know, that, that the beer's not going to, uh, you know, go too low and end up creating a bunch of bombs, but... Yeah, I would definitely do a forced carbonation test if you're going to do this method in a bottle. <laughs> oh, lordy, lordy. All right, Tony. Uh, fermented interruptus. You should make some shirts, bud. Uh, <laughs> all right. Vincent Lau uh, said, I'd be worried about not enough yeast to scrub out diacetyl by racking off during primary fermentation too early uh, for lager. I guess if you lager for six months, that won't be a problem. Uh, I don't think lagering itself, you know, at cold temperatures gets rid of diacetyl too much. I, th I think it requires yeast activity. Uh, to do that. I wouldn't be worried about it. I think there is more than enough yeast in there. I think where you run into the issues with a lack of yeast uh, uh, to do certain things in your beer is after you've let it sit at cold temperatures for a long time. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I could yeah. be wrong there. I mean, did you taste diacetyl in your beers? No. Yeah. And you also did, you did uh, sort of a, a diacetyl rest as well by ramping them up, uh, you know, uh, 15 or so degrees. Uh, right. I, I would, th I think that most people these days who are making loggers probably do that. So, uh, but it's a, it's a valid concern, you know, um, it, it, if you don't, if you're, if you're taking all of that beer off of 
the yeast cake. The other thing to think about, though, is that you know, ostensibly the, the yeast that are at the bottom of the keg or the are, bottom of your fermenter. Yeah. yeah, are basically done. So they're not they're Those aren't the ones that are going to be metabolizing diacetyl anyways. So, right. It's the ones that are currently in solution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which are the ones that you're taking to the spunding tank, um, you know, when you rack it over. So, all right. Uh, next, next comment comes from Nate. He says, I'm finding lately that many home brewers actually prefer sweeter, slightly oxidized beers over fresh, crisp, non-oxidized beers but i don't think this has anything to do with spunning but he says personally i don't get it sweet heavy honey aromas and flavors are not refreshing um i mean i know we all have opinions on this um i don't i don't know it. sure there are some oxidized beers out there and that is a familiar flavor to people yeah um i don't when we, when we start talking about flavor and preference we get into more of a philosophical realm um <laughs> You know, you know, you can say a beer is technically better to a certain set of standards, um, and that may or may not be true. But if somebody likes something else more, who am I to say that one's better than the other? Uh, honestly, drink your oxidized hazy beers. I don't give a shit. And and uh, and truthfully, uh, we were just talking about this uh, with the crew earlier today, actually. And I, and Ray made the comment, you know, that he said something along the lines of, "I think a lot of uh, of beer that people out there really like, I taste it, and it just tastes like a, a sweet." oxidized caramely mess but uh like you mentioned jake people are that that's familiar to them it's what people who are entering craft beer now have access to um and and if that's what they cut their chops on if that's what they end up preferring uh you know who are we to say that it's bad I, i may not like it as much um it's bad to me on a subjective level but uh you know if they like it hey more power to them you know agree also, yuck, man. Oxidized beer? Ugh. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, the worst. <laughs> you know, though, this is complete tangent. I do think that there may be something about uh, bigger beers like Russian Imperial Stout and Barley Wine that benefit maybe maybe a touch from some oxidation. People talk about that sherry character developing. Um, so it's it, maybe it's not all bad, uh, but for the most part, in the beers that I drink, no thanks. Same. All right, next comment comes from Tom R. Uh, He says, I had read that spunding is key for New England IPA. There you go, to prevent aroma carryoff by the CO2. Any chance we can see a similar experiment with a a more aroma-forward style? Yeah, we can probably get Jake to to do another one with a favorite style. Yeah, I think it seems like every time we hear about New England IPA, there's something new that's key to the style (sighs) and and traditional for the style. Um, But I would certainly be willing to do a spunding uh, experiment with New England IPA. I think... It would especially benefit from doing that in some sort of unit tank with a dump valve. So I'm not going to clog anything. Yeah, no joke. Or, or yeah, yeah, exactly. Or you use those, um, you know, Brian just did his experiment on those sleeves, those stainless sleeves. I've been using them. Right. They look great. Yeah. I don't know. When I think about New England IPA and the potential benefits of spunding, for me, it's not so much about the this aroma carryoff idea. I'm not at all convinced that uh, like like people used to say back in the day a ton and we and you know again Brian did an experiment on this one that when you rack to a keg and then you do that whole thing where you purge the headspace uh, that that you're you know get you're depleting the aromatic you know compounds that that end up could otherwise end up in the beer uh, they're in the headspace dude if they're in the headspace they're not in your beer so to me that that piece of it doesn't necessarily make sense uh, but maybe just maybe spunding would have an impact on uh, aromatic pungency and it'd be interesting to test out yeah definitely. All right, uh, final comment comes from a guy named Aaron, um, and he says, is there a good reason to wait until the very last minute to put on the spunding valve? Ooh, this is a great question. Why not just a great question. Yeah, why not just put it on when you know there's still extract remaining, whether it be half or a few gravity points? Is it annoyingly loud, <laughs> maybe? Or is there a worry of it clogging if fermentation is too vigorous? Uh, worry that you worry that the yeast won't perform well under pressure? I, I absolutely see where he's coming from. If you've got a spunding valve why, that is going to, you know, carbonate the beer basically by putting it on by holding it at a specific uh, PSI, why can't you just leave that on the entire time? No, that's a great question. And I kind of alluded to that a little bit earlier um, in terms of how I'm brewing specifically for myself now when I am spunding. Um, so we've all probably fermented in some sort of clear type fermentation vessel. And you know that as those bubbles start to die down, the foam is really starting to die down too, or the croisin. Um, so at that point with my SS brew buckets, as soon as I see that the, the, those bubble 
um, those bubbles or that bubbling activity starting to die down to a point where it's like, you know, I don't know if I've ever actually timed it, but probably one every 10 seconds or so. Sure. I'll be like, okay, this is probably good. And I'm just going to keg it. And I don't care what the gravity is. And then I'll put the spunding valve on it and it turns out great. Gotcha. One of the reasons, so when I read this question from Aaron, uh, my mind automatically went to this concept of, of uh, fermenting in the keg that you're also going to serve from. Uh, to me, the biggest concern that I would have with, uh, in, in essence, fermenting under pressure, and that's another great thing spunding valves are, are good for. Are they And there's a lot of fun uh presumption out there about how you can ferment lagers warm as long as you do it, you know, and under eight to 10 PSI of, of pressure or whatever. Um, so spunding valves are great for that. My, my bigger concern uh, would be CO2 toxicity on the yeast. Again, people have gotten away with quite, they quite often do actually uh, fermenting beers under pressure. So that may not be something to worry about. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think the bigger concern with using a spunding valve um, on a fermentation vessel like that would be that clogging. Um, just because, especially with those corny kegs, which you're mostly using a spunding valve on, yeah, the liquid level is so close to the top. Um, I think you really have to be careful with the type of yeast you use and where you leave that headspace line at. Yeah, no, good points. Uh, thanks for the comment, Aaron, and everyone else. Uh, Jake, that is all the time we've got for this episode. Uh, I, I am I am much more interested in trying out my two spunding valves now after talking with you about them. Do you have any last words on spunding? Uh, I don't. I, I, I think that anybody who, um, you know, in the homebrew world uh, wants to be kind of environmentally conscious, I think this is a great technique to look into um, and, and something that I've definitely embraced as part of my brewing process. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Sounds good. Uh, don't forget to head over to brewlosophy.com to read up on the experiment discussed in this episode as well as everything else we're up to. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man. No.